I have never left the university once I entered it in 1969. I was inspired by my primary two English teacher. She was very beautiful, she was very young, she was very attractive, and she was basically someone who liked me a lot. So I thought I'll just write a poem about her. I don't remember much of what I actually wrote, but the title was My Teacher. I have a teacher called Miss Lau, whose face is like Tau Sa Pao. Now, of course, uh, <laughs> this led me to my very first uh, lesson about cross-cultural uh, you know, communication and all that. I grew up with my uh, late uncle, my father's elder brother who brought me up, and he was convinced that the future, meaning you know, 19, from 1950 onwards, uh, the future belonged to the English world, meaning those who spoke English. And so he made sure that I was always exposed to a whole variety of books in the library. Well, I grew up with a whole lot of uh, history. Uh, as I was growing up in Singapore, the primary schools were still following a very colonial syllabus. We were brought up on Janet and John, book one, book two. You know, you probably have never heard of these readers, right? Um, because by the time Singapore became self-governing in 1959, I was already moving on to primary four. So my first three years were very solidly like in a British English kind of educative style. Then from the time we became a self-governing sort of island, the historical consciousness changed a little bit because we suddenly became aware that though we were different culturally, the Malays, the Chinese, the Eurasians, the Indians, we were trying to forge a nation. Because even in the earliest of speeches, uh, you know, Lee Kuan Yew had already started talking about it, and before him, even David Marshall had started talking about it. This idea of a racial harmony thing began to be uh, taught in schools in one way or another. I mean, we used to have a lot of time sitting and talking together to see how can we make fellow Singaporeans realize that there are writers in English in Singapore. You know, and these writers are not white English, but they are like Singaporean Chinese, Singaporean Malays, Indians, and all of that, you know. Today, the challenge is to convince my fellow citizens that we are bloody good at it, that we are not just writing, but we're writing good stuff. I'm working on a, on a long piece of fiction, which will explore, I think, the agony and also the ecstasy, the joys and the pains, the aches and the glories of an uh, you know, individual like myself. Not many people know that I'm in every sense a real Eurasian because I'm, I'm Sikh on my father's side. Father is Sikh, but mum is Scottish. And so uh, because I wear the turban and all of that, people never think of me like having a Scottish mother, you know. And so in my sort of advanced years, I'm, uh, as the Americans would say, giving myself permission to take ownership of my legacy <laughs> and of my inheritance. And so I'm working on a story of, um, of an individual who's very much like me, I think. Honesty is not something that a lot of people can handle very well. Uh, some people blame it on our Asianness and our, you know, being very sensitive and our politeness and making courtesy our way of life for so long that sometimes to be honest is not courteous. But I think the greatest courtesy is to be honest with yourself and then with the people around you. I'm very proud to say that my poems are among the most studied overseas. And I think the only reason I can think about this and for this is that, you know, I mean, thank God I've always been very honest. It does come with a very, very powerful sense of wanting to be nothing short of being honest.